I haven't got the, the full control on all of the uh, all of the continuation exams. Uh, I think there was one yesterday, so I doubt there is one today. But uh, they might be just late with the buses and everything. So, <coughs> right, we'll start off with uh, hydraulic systems for today. So we have our learning goals as usual. We're going to get to know how switching overlap works and the effects of switching overlap. And we're going to know how control edges work and their effects. So this is all inside the valves. And we're going to become familiar with pressure regulators, how they work. And we're going to know how pressure relief valves work in specific. And we're also going to know how pressure reducing valves work in specific. And then we're going to start looking at directional control valves. So we'll continue with those uh, on Friday. So switching overlap. <coughs> so the, the uh, performance of the valve is determined by the uh, overlap, so, so the switching performance. When you are actually activating the valve, moving it from one position to another, the performance of how that is going to, to act upon the system is determined by the overlap on the system. And the overlap is, like shown here, where we have a positive overlap. So we have a port which is connected either to the pump or to uh, the hydraulic system. So what we want to do if we are opening up this valve, we are going to move the slide so that we get some movement to one of the sides here, that we can move fluid that way. And when we have a positive overlap, it means that the slide actually covers more than, than the opening that it needs to cover, which also means that it has to move, uh, it has to move further than, than the length of the overlap in order to open up uh, move, uh, flow uh, through the valve. <coughs> so for an example, if we have a two millimeter overlap here, we'll have to actually move the entire slide two millimeters and then even more before it starts opening for flow. So anything more than two millimeters of movement, that's going to open the flow. But you can move it two full millimeters without uh, opening any flow for the, uh, for the valve. <coughs> and considering that if you have a sliding valve like this one, you can actually have many pistons on the same slide as you're moving. So some of the pistons can have a positive overlap like this, others can have negative and uh, some can have no overlap at all. We're going to look at those alternatives later on, which means that the different ports on your, on your uh, valve, the different ports that are leading either to the pump or to the tank or to the components in the system where you're connecting all of your hoses and pipes, those will have different effects as you're moving the slide. Because if you have a, a positive one here, and the next slide over is, uh, uh, doesn't have any overlap at all. And then the next piston over on the slide has a negative overlap. All of those are going to act differently when you are moving the slide. So even though all of the pistons are moving at the same time and doing the same distance, they are going to uh, create different effects in their ports. So for the positive ones, it means that as we are moving the switch from one side to the other, uh, there will be a point where all of the ports are closed, so that, as we can see here, everything is closed at, a, at one single time. So, so for those two millimeters of movement in either direction here, if that was uh, the case, then we could move it, uh, those two millimeters, and all of the ports would stay closed. No fluid flow at all past this piston. <coughs> but this means that uh, the pressure doesn't collapse here, because you don't have openings between ports as you are moving the switch. So it means that you are containing the pressure within the ports. So, so since everything is closed off, the pressure that you pumped into your system is going to stay there because it has nowhere to go. It's uh, being blocked completely off by, by the piston, which is exactly what you need, uh, for an example, if you are running an accumulator, because then you want the accum accumulator to uh, keep the pressure up at all times because you want to have it as backup in case uh, you're using the accumulator as an emergency power source in the system, then for all uh, means you don't want the pressure to disappear from the accumulator every time you're switching a valve. 
So that's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most important uses for, for positive overlap, but it is used in other, other cases also. But this might mean that we get switching impacts, uh, and that basically means that uh, when you're switching a valve like this with a positive overlap, you can actually see uh, all of the uh, hosings and tubes that you are have coming out of your valves. They're going to s sort of jump when you are uh, switching the valve. And that's because you're going to get a pressure peak so that the, the fluid in that is flowing through the valve is going to abruptly stop. And there's full pressure on both sides. So it sort of gets a full jerk and it starts shaking on all of the uh, pipes uh, and tubes. So that's uh, one problem uh, with those... Uh, uh, valves that have positive overlap is that you you, uh, you subject your system to a lot of uh, forces that is not necessarily that good for it so, so that you can uh, over time you can get fatigue damage to your system so that uh, in and of itself uh, a switching impact um, that shakes everything up a bit is not going to do any damage but if you're uh, think if this is a system where you are switching this valve a couple of hundred times a day every day for a couple of years then this is going to end up uh, again uh, end up uh, uh, becoming uh, the sort of damage that builds up over time so even though the force is very low it's not not something that's going to immediately break the system over time it can cause damage uh, and we're going to look a bit uh, later on uh, when we're looking at the control edges how how such switching impacts can be uh, diminished a bit so that you uh, you don't get this problem yeah uh, the valve I is to switch for, for an example in this uh, case if we have uh, if we have pressure from the pump coming in through this port then we would want pressure for an example to go to one side of a cylinder or to the other side of the cylinder so depending on which way we are sliding the valve it's going to decide which way the flow is going so if we slide the valve over here then the flow is going to go this way and it's going to extend the piston and then if we slide the valve back it's going to stop the flow and then we continue sliding it over there the flow is going this way and then it's going to retract the piston <coughs> um, also one problem uh, with these uh, positive overlaps is that you get a hard startup because you are blocking off the pump completely uh, when this one is in the uh, closed position uh, so that the pump is basically going to start building up pressure and it's going to just slam into the piston of this valve and it just stops there. It doesn't get a, a slow buildup of the pressure. So, so uh, it's uh, a bit hard for the system to, to start up when you have, have these kinds of valves. Uh, one workaround I know for some systems is that they, uh, they uh, utilize uh, sensors which tell when they are starting up the system so that they send electrical signals to electrically controlled valves, which we're going to look at a bit later on how, th how that works. Uh, and those signals then tell the valve to actually open for the startup. And then once the system has gotten up to the, uh, up to the uh, operating pressure, then it closes the valve just so that it gets the, uh, gets the startup uh, on the way and uh, the system is running uh, fully before it uh, closes off. So then we're going to look at uh, valves that have no overlap at all. So that means that the edge of the piston aligns perfectly with the edges of uh, this chamber on both sides. So, so basically, any movement at all to either side is going to open flow to the opposite side. So any movement this way could be uh, 0.001 millimeters movement this way, and it's going to open up flow to that side and the same for that way and then it's going to open up flow for the other side <coughs> uh, so this this means that uh, basically th these edges uh, the edge of the piston and the edge of the chamber is what what's called control edges we're going to look more at them uh, in, in the next part and those are important for, for very fast operating valves so if you need to, um, to have your valve react very quickly, for an example, if it's a pressure relief valve, it's going to uh, very quickly open up so that it can release uh, a pressure peak back to the tank, then it needs to, to have, uh, have zero overlap. 
because then it's going to react instantly more or less. Uh, as soon as it gets some uh, feedback that it needs to open, then it starts opening and you get an instant flow uh, through it. Uh, you use uh, fast switching uh, valves for other tasks also, not only for pressure relief, but, but it, uh, it depends a bit on the use that you're going to, to use it for. And then we have the ones that have a negative overlap. So this means that if you place the piston in the center, you're going to have flow to both sides. So it doesn't actually close off any of the uh, flows. It's only when you actually move the piston over to one side that it starts closing off uh, one of the uh, flow directions. <coughs> so uh, this means, of course, that you get flow through all of the ports when you, uh, when you have it in, uh, in the neutral position. And this also means that we get a brief pressure collapse, especially if you're moving the piston from this side and over to this side. Then for a very brief moment in the middle here, you're going to get flow to, to uh, all ports, which means that it's going to lose all pressure because you're going to get flow going directly back to tank and out to all components and everything. So it's, it's sort of a, uh, you lose all resistance in, in the system since you are and get the connection back to, uh, back to your tank. Uh, that way. Uh, which means that, for example, if you have a piston that is lifting up a weight, so you have a cylinder that's pushing up a weight, it's holding it up there, and then you switch over one of these, then you're going to briefly lose pressure so that the uh, cylinder itself might actually be pushed back by the weight before the cylinder gets over to the other side and then it, and then it uh, re regains uh, pressure in the system. Uh, and this is um, sort of the opposite of the uh, positive overlap, where in the positive overlap you get these sort of jolts going through the system as it closes off uh, all ports. While in this one you get none of that, because you get free flow instead, because you're not closing off all of the ports at once. You're keeping all of the ports open as you're moving a piston, so that you, uh, you don't get these uh, pressure problems. So if your system... <coughs> uh, if your system... Uh, doesn't really rely on keeping pressure up at all times. It is a bit better to use uh, one of these with negative overlap. And we are going to look more uh, as we get along, especially on Friday, we're going to look more at how the control valves work, work the directional control valves. And that is uh, uh, often where, where these principles are used in order to gain different results from the different positions of the valves. So we are getting more, more into this uh, as we go along. <coughs> so some of these uh, with the uh, negative overlap uh, uh, make it so that we get uh, an initial opening of the pressure line so that we, as we start moving it, we get uh, uh, pressure going from the pump and out to the components into the system, but we haven't opened the return line yet. So that is only when we continue moving it that the return line is also going to be open. So it depends a bit on, on the geometry uh, inside it. And the same goes for, for uh, the opposite way around. You can design it so that it's going to open up flow back to the tank before it opens up flow uh, from the pump. So that you get, uh, you sort of make sure that you have free access back to your tank before you uh, allow the pressure from the pump to, to enter your system. Which can be nice to have, for an example, if you have a, have an, uh, a motor uh, connected to, to your system. So then you want to make sure that the motor uh, is going to, to spin right off as soon as you open up uh, the pressure line. So then you make sure that the, the return line is open already, going past the uh, motor, so that the flow, as soon as you open up the pressure, the flow is going to go through the motor and straight back to tank, as it's supposed to do. <coughs> if you use this option where you are initially opening the pressure line but you're keeping the tank closed, then the flow is going to go to the motor, the motor is going to briefly spin, and then it's going to hit the valve that is closing off uh, the return line. So you're not going to get a flow across your motor. <coughs> uh, yeah, and I briefly mentioned earlier that you may uh, vary the switch switching overlap from piston to piston inside one valve. You can have many pistons inside one valve, and uh, you can sort of decide 
what the characteristics are going to be for each of those pistons, what's going to happen once it starts moving. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that all of the pistons are connected to the same rod. So when you're moving uh, the piston rod, you're going to move all of the pistons the same distance. So that's how you, you sort of, uh, uh, all of them are going to have the same amount of travel, uh, same length of travel, all of the pistons. But by uh, designing different overlaps for the different ports that are going to be used, you can make sure that one port opens before another one, for example. If one port has less of an overlap than another one, it's going to open brief, uh, open a short time before the other one opens. So even though you're moving the slide all the way over, one is going to open before the other. So it's uh, one of the ways of uh, fixing uh, flows to, to work in your favor in a system. So with a positive overlap, we have uh, this piston that's going to move on this side. And we can see here already with uh, the positive overlap side, it's going all the way into the center chamber, the, the control edge of the piston. So it's really, it's a, it's a really long piston compared to the, the pressure chamber on the side here. But as we're looking at the negative overlap, the piston is just barely uh, covering the, the pressure chamber there. So we have the, the pressure line coming in here. This is uh, sort of a, a very simplified symbol for, for a pump uh, on these ones. And then we have the P for pressure, which is the usual way of signifying that this is the port coming into the valve where we are getting pressure from our pump. <coughs> and then we have A, which is going to some components. It is possible to have multiple ports up here. Then they are usually either named A, B, C, D if you have more than two. Most often it's going to be two ports, so you have A and B. Um, I have seen some manufacturers using one, two, three, four uh, on their ports, but usually then you have a manual which says that port one equals A, port two equals P, and stuff like that, so that they're, they're going to have a, a, a way of showing you what is what. And then, of course, we have T, which is going back to the tank. And this little symbol here is a simplified symbol. So instead of, uh, if, if we had a, an entire uh, hydraulic system uh, drawn in here, instead of pulling the return line all the way back to the actual uh, tank symbol in our entire hydraulic schematics, we do this abbreviation. Because by doing uh, this, that we have a T line, and it's going straight into to this uh, jar, more or less, that it looks like. It's, uh, it signifies that this one is going directly to tank. We don't need to draw a full line going all the way back to the tank. If we have the symbol on it, it's going back to tank either way. So it's a way of uh, sort of um, making the drawings easier to read because you won't have all of these return lines going back to the same spot. <coughs> so when we're looking at the, the main chamber here, we can see that we have uh, a full flow fr from our component and back to our tank. So if this was, for an example, a uh, single acting cylinder, it would have been uh, pushed all the way back either by the load or by uh, a spring I inside the cylinder, and there would be no pressure left inside the pressure chamber of the cylinder. <coughs> and this is the, uh, the symbol that is used for, for this kind of slide valve. And what it says is that we have the pressure port here, and it is closed, so it's just running into a, a blind street there. So it's a, it can't go anywhere, it just stops there. And then we have an arrow going from our A port and down to our T port, so that it shows us that we have full flow coming from our, com from our component and to our return line, and our pressure line is blocked off. It can't do anything. Then if we actually move the slide a bit, over to the side here, we're going to see that for the positive one, we have still blocked off all of the uh, pressure. It hasn't opened anything there yet. It, it's about to open, so if we move it even more, it's going to open up uh, the pressure going into the components. But now it's actually blocked off, uh, it keeps the pressure blocked off, and it's also blocked off the return to tank already. So, so that uh, now it's uh, keeping all of the fluid that's left uh, from coming from the component and into the valve. 
all the fluids that left there, and that's just lying around in the system because it's uh, gravity hasn't pulled it back into the tank, then it's uh, just going to stay there. So it's just locked inside. While at the negative overlap, we can see that it's opened up the pressure line, so it's pressurized the uh, components. But also, the piston on this side is equally small, so it, has, I it hasn't closed off the return line yet. So this means that right now, we have a very slow start on our system because we are pushing some slight amount of pressure up to our cylinder, probably not enough to move it at all. And most of it is just going straight back into the tank. So basically, we just have a loop going here now that's going uh, through the pump and back to the tank and through the pump and back to the tank. So it's, it's basically uh, just going in circles. Yeah, that was uh, what I just showed. <coughs> and that means that we have, uh, we have moved away from this symbol, which we had over here. So we move away from that symbol and we've ended up with a new symbol here. So in this case, with a positive overlap, everything is blocked off. So nothing is getting anywhere. And with the negative overlap, we have full connection between everything. So the tank is connected to the main line going between, between the pump and, uh, and the components, which basically means that the flow is mostly just going up here and then back to the tank because uh, there won't be enough resistance in the system uh, to actually run, uh, run the cylinder in this case. So if we now had uh, decided to slide the valve even further to the side, there wasn't an, a good illustration for that in, uh, in the book, but uh, they did put in the symbol for it, then we would get uh, the fact that only the pressure side would be open on the positive overlap one. So the pressure side would be open up to A, and the return line would be closed. As we can see in the symbol here, a line going from P to A, and then the T being closed off. And for the negative overlap, we would get the same effect. So as we move it even further over, this piston is going to block off the return line and we're going to get full flow just between the, uh, the pump and the components. <coughs> um, so, sort of to, to try to show you the principle here of, uh, of these boxes that are used in the symbols. Basically, each box is one position of the slide, so that it's going to give you one function. In this case, we have the slide placed in the middle, so we're looking at the middle box, and we are getting full flow between all three ports. And we can also see, if we're looking at the slide there, we're getting full flow between all three ports. If we had moved the slide even further to the side here, then it would be this box that would be, be the one that was uh, telling us what's happening inside the valve. Because usually you, you won't be able to, to look at this slide valve like this, so, so you can't actually see that it's moving. Uh, the only thing you can see is the, uh, if, if it's a manually operated one where you actually have a hand lever that you are pulling back and forth, then you can actually uh, sort of determine what position it is in from the hand lever. If it's an electrically operated one, you're going to have to be fully reliant on whatever signals the, uh, the electrical system is giving you. So if it's telling you that it's in th this position, then you just have to assume that it is in that position. And you ha you'll have to check the effects on your system. Is the flow actually going from, from your pump and up to your components and not uh, being connected to the tank? So we, we are going to, uh, on Friday, we're going to look uh, even more closely uh, at these uh, symbols, the, the square boxes that uh, are used and how, how everything works. <coughs> so for a positive overlap, we have all ports briefly closed in the center position. And as we can see here uh, in our symbol, the center position, everything is closed off. And the system pressure will act Im immediately on the component if we continue moving the piston to the side so that we get, there won't be any leakage going over to, uh, to the uh, tank line, so everything will just shoot straight up and right into a cylinder if it's a cylinder that we've connected to this one. But on the negative overlap, 
we do get this pressure relief that the, uh, that the return side is opened up so that even though we are getting pressure pushed in here, it's not going to really affect the cylinder much until we move the piston all the way over. And then it's going to be a sort of a slow buildup because you will gradually close off the connection to, to the uh, return line, which means that you're basically just throttling down the flow going to the return line, so gradually reducing the flow as you're moving the piston over. And then you are getting uh, finally everything going straight up to the component. So it's a, a gentle pressure buildup wh while you're starting it up. So it depends really a lot on what system you're using, but, but these are very good to use uh, both in a startup phase and also with regards to, to uh, avoiding these, these uh, pressure peaks that you get uh, from the positive overlap, where you get really a lot of jerking in, in all of the systems, so, so everything can jump around quite a lot. Um, So we've got a little bit more on uh, switching overlap. So for slide valves, we determine the switching overlap uh, by the geometry of our control edges and of how rigid the connection is uh, with the control pistons. And for puppet valves, the switching overlap, we get that by using various response times for uh, individual valves and it can be changed through changing the actuation time. So actually, how much time it takes to move the valve. So by, by making sure that one valve is moving slower than another valve, might be enough to, and to, uh, to be able to regulate the switching overlap. Because you, rem you remember the puppet valves, those are the ones that are where we have the flow coming coming directly towards the piston, and we are moving the piston up and down. And the flow, if we are moving the piston up, then the flow will pass over on the side here. So it will go through the ports on the side. While with the slide valves, our piston is moving sideways instead. So we will have flow coming in here, and as we move the piston Sideways, we will open up flow coming past, past the piston. <coughs> Which, of course, means that for, for, for the slide valves, we can do a lot by manipulating this control edge. So we, we can do different stuff wi with that edge. So we're going to look at that in a bit. But for, for these puppet valves, the, the basically the only way that you can regulate that in any sense is to, to, to manipulate how much time it uses in moving up and down. And usually most puppet valves are quite fast, so they are usually working really fast. But, but you, can, you can design systems where, where you have puppet valves that are moving slower. <coughs> and one of the ways uh, and that you can uh, design basically a system more or less like, like what you would do with a slide valve, where you're putting several pistons on, on the same slide, getting everything basically just baked into one valve. You can get the same effect using puppet valves, but then you have to uh, connect three, four valves, maybe even more uh, together in order to manage to, to create the same effect as you would from one slide valve. And then in the slide valve, you could possibly have had over on this side, you might have had a, a positive overlap uh, maybe zero overlap on this one, and then maybe negative overlap on two of the others, just to make an example. While in this one, you would have to have, if you're using puppet valves, you would have to have a fast acting one there, which was the, uh, the one with the positive overlap, because that one's going to shut off very quickly, so it's going to disconnect the flow. And then you have the ones with negative overlap, you would have slow acting, because you didn't want them to... to to uh, react too quickly, so you would sort of gradually close them. And then for the, the one with, uh, with zero overlap would most likely be a very uh, swift acting one also, just like the, the one with positive, because you wanted to, to, to react fast then. So, so here you can see is sort of the problem. If you're going to do complex controls of a system, a slide valve is 
quite a lot easier to use. You, you get a lot of functions baked into one valve. Well, if you're going to use puppet valves, you're suddenly going to have to connect three or four or five or even more valves to each other in order to make them work in a system so that they're going to open and close uh, in the uh, correct order. So it makes, makes for a very complicated system and you're going to get, uh, get quite a lot of, uh, get a lot of wear and tear on this system. So you, you, you're probably going to have to use uh, more time for maintenance on it which is also why the slide valves are very much used as soon as you need, uh, need more than, uh, more than uh, two or three ports. So, then we are on to the control edges. So the ones we've looked at for now have the, the straight control edge, so a sh sharp edge. And this means that it will abruptly reduce the volumetric flow because as soon as this sharp edge here reaches the sharp edge of the, uh, of the chamber that it's closing off, it's going to be completely closed off. So you, you don't have any reductions or anything in flow rate, so, so you get just a really abrupt uh, cutoff in flow. But then you have the possibility of chamfering the edge just as we've uh, looked at in, in Inventor a couple of times, uh, where you can actually use a chamfer to, uh, to, um, to make an edge less sharp. And then you also have the possibility of just creating notches in the edge. So those are the ones that are called notched. And whether it's chamfered or it's notched, it's basically going to give you the same effect, but the chamfered one is going to let more flow through than the notched one. So the notched one has a smaller cross-sectional area for the flow to pass through. So what happens is that as soon as we get the, the uh, control edge of the chamber, when it hits the same control edge as the piston has, it's not completely closed off because all of these notches will allow flow through them for a little while. As the piston continues moving and the control edge of the uh, chamber is moved over to this this side of the notches, then it's going to be completely closed off. <coughs> and the same goes for, for the chamfered edge, but, but you will get a gradual reduction in flow rate so that you don't get this very hard stop uh, that you would get from the, uh, from the sharp one. So it, it depends a bit on, uh, on basically what fun function you're going to have on your, uh, on your valve. And I think it's fairly unlikely that any of you are going to sit down and actually design uh, a valve uh, in, in the kind of work that you're going to do because those are usually designed by very experienced people working at uh, the different hydraulics manufacturing uh, 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 companies around the world. Uh, so most likely you're just going to, to be designing the system itself, so you're going to be choosing valves. But then it's nice to know about these things because if you didn't know about these control edges and that it was possible to, to, uh, to fix them, then you would probably just buy sharp control edges for all of your valves. And all of your valves would cut off abruptly and you would get these uh, jerking motions in your uh, tubes and in your pipes. And uh, you could basically damage your system over time by using that. So that is sort of the point with, with this uh, course is that we are going to learn how the valves work so that it will be easier for you to choose the correct ones when you're going to design systems. But then we're going to start looking at pressure regulators. They control and regulate the pressure in the overall hydraulic system, but also in subsections of the hydraulic systems. So you would most likely use a pressure regulator uh, in close vicinity to your pump, in order to make sure that the pump would not exceed its uh, maximum operating pressure. So that if you get a pressure peak, for example, if, you, uh, if you're running it on a, a diesel engine and it, the engine for some reason suddenly revs up a bit so that it's running the pump even faster, then the pump can quickly go past its operating uh, pressure. And if it gets too far uh, past its operating pressure, it's going to pass its maximum operating pressure and then you would uh, be in risk of damaging your pump. And then if you have uh, a pressure regulator 
connected to your pump, then it's just going to open up as soon as it uh, hits uh, a high enough pressure. It's just going to open up and you get a free flow back to your tank. So your pressure is going to instantly drop down to a, to a more, more acceptable level. So that's one, one, of, the, uh, one of the uses for it. Uh, other things might be in, uh, in vicinity to, to uh, components inside the system that will be sensitive to pressure peaks. So that if you would get a spike of pressure like this, so that the pressure would suddenly rise uh, in a graph, you, you would get uh, a sudden spike uh, in a graph of your pressure. It might not be enough to, to damage your system and your pump might be able to handle it. It might not uh, trigger the pressure regulator that's connected to your pump. But it might be too much for one specific component inside your system that's not going to handle that high of a pressure. So then you would have another pressure regulator connected to the circuit that this component is, uh, is uh, placed in. And it's going to make sure that the pressure never exceeds the maximum operating pressure of the component. And that might be lower than the operating pressure of the, of the pump. But then that one does the same. It just opens up a connection to the tank so that you get a free flow and you just sort of bleed off some of the, the pressure back to the tank, and then you get an acceptable pressure again. And other, other ways uh, of using pressure regulators is basically to take a, uh, a, uh, a very inconsistent pressure rate. So if, if you're looking over time at a graph on, on your pressure, you might have a pressure that's basically going in waves over here, so it's constantly rising and sinking up and down, up and down, and, go, and going maybe uh, at a range between 180, 220 bars. So it's constantly fluctuating b uh, between, uh, between those pressures. And then you can use uh, another type of pressure regulator to basically take this very fluctuating pressure into the regulator, and out of the regulator, you get a steady stream of, for example, 170 bar. So you have too much you have uh, higher pressure coming in, but it's a very, uh, very uh, inconsistent pressure. You don't have a constant pressure coming in, so it's constantly fluctuating instead. And then going out, you have a lower pressure, but it is constant. So you're delivering exactly 170 bars to your components on that side. So that's one way of uh, regulating pressure also. So we have basically two types where we're looking at this. We have pressure relief valves which are typically the ones that are placed close to the pump or close to a pressure-sensitive component where they will basically just open up to the tank and release the pressure in there until uh, the pressure is dropped to, to uh, an acceptable level. <coughs> so you select uh, what pressure you want to have them. So these are usually, you can usually adjust them uh, and they usually have a range so that if you have have uh, a system that's running around 200 bars uh, in your hydraulic system, uh, it might be nice to, to choose a pressure regulator that has a range of, let's say, 190 to 230 bars, so that you could actually regulate it a bit up and down, depending on what you want uh, as the maximum pressure in your system. And they use uh, a pilot pressure, so they are actually having a small port going into uh, the uh, inlet port of the valve. And if this pressure exceeds uh, the, the uh, selected pressure that you put up, it's going to open up the valve. So, so basically, you're using the pressure itself to tell when the valve is going to open. So if you have, uh, if you have adjusted your valve to 220 bars, as soon as the pressure in this pilot port, which is a very, very thin opening, uh, very narrow opening that's going into, to, uh, uh, into, the, into the valve, basically usually pushing on, on, uh, on some sort of uh, smaller pilot valve inside. Then it's, <coughs> as soon as it hits that 220 bar mark, that smaller valve is going to open up. And that means that the larger valve is also going to open up. And when the larger valve opens up, then you are bleeding off the pressure so that you, uh, you get to reduce the pressure. Then you have the ones that are called pressure reducing valves. So, so we are basically differentiating them through relief or reduction. So relief is when we get unintentionally high pressures, then we are relieving the system of that high pressure. While the pressure reducing valves, they usually 
are used to, to make sure that you can supply different pressure levels at different circuits inside your system. So for an example, if you have uh, several things connected in into your uh, system, you have your pump and your tank, everything at the, at the start, you have directional control valves and you have several circuits going in there. So you have, uh, you have a motor running something, you have several pistons in different circuits. Some of the pistons operate at 200 bars, uh, some of them are really small, so they operate at maybe just 50 bars. The motor operates best at 150 bars. Then you would use pressure reducing valves on these different circuits. So that for the pistons operating at 200 bars, you would probably use the maximum pressure of the system. So that the maximum pressure would be 200 bars. That would go freely into those cylinders. But for the very small cylinders that only uh, could tolerate 50 bars or so, then you would use a pressure reducing valve on that specific circuit. So that whenever you open up pressure from, uh, from your pump, so you open up your valve, you are connecting the pump to the cylinders, they first have to pass through a pressure reducing valve that is going to take this 200 bar pressure that's coming in and it's going to just drop the pressure down to 50. So that anything coming out of the pressure reducing valve, it's going to be 50 bars and it's going to be perfect for those small cylinders. And the same for the uh, motor that's running at 150 bars. You get 200 bars going into the pressure reducing valve on that circuit and you get 150 coming out so that you get the perfect pressure for, for, your, uh, for your motor. So, so those are used uh, more as an active component in your system. So they actively uh, change the characteristics of your different parts of your system. So they change the pressure in the different parts. While the pressure relief ones just make sure that you don't exceed the maximum pressure that you've set. So I think we'll, we'll do a break before we continue on. So I will, um, we'll have a 15 minute break.
Okay, first off, I've got a message from uh, Frederick. Uh, as of yesterday at noonish, he still hadn't received any of the answers to what course you wanted to choose. So he really needs to get those in by today because they're starting their meeting and deciding which course they're going to uh, to be offering, uh, which courses they're going to be offering in uh, tomorrow morning. So he really needs to have all of your answers during this day, uh, sometime. So uh, try to get that done. Uh, he was uh, a bit freaked out about it. I think he didn't want to uh, to end up going to this meeting uh, and not really having uh, the answers of everyone there. Um, wouldn't be all that good. <laughs> so we need to know wh what you want to. So um, <coughs> I brought over something from the the uh, hydraulics lab, which is basically a um, it's a slide valve that's been uh, cut in two. So it's basically it's just been sawed off uh, along the length here, and here we have the slide for it. And as you can see. <coughs> I'll just uh, place this one here for now. As you can see from this slide here, we have we have different piston parts that are going to, to block off uh, different sections of the slide valve. But we also have a lot of holes going through some of them. And uh, as you can see also here, we have a hole going straight through here. And it is connected to the holes going in at an angle here so that we can get flow coming into this room here. I'm not quite sure what kind of valve this is. It doesn't say anything in uh, on any of the sign plates on it. But this slide goes in here. It's a bit difficult to get in when it's uh, been sawed up here. And then we have a different valve here on this side. So the whole point with, with this hole uh, allowing uh, uh, fluid flow to come into this room is probably to be able to activate this one so that you would open it up. And whether that is in order to be able to push this one further in, I'm not quite sure. Uh, since I don't have the entire uh, thing and don't know what it's supposed to do, I'm not quite sure all of the uh, uh, things that this one is doing. But this is the basic, basic uh, design of a slide uh, valve, so that you have different ports coming in where you will connect pipes and hoses, and then you have the slide that you're pulling back and forth with your, either with a hand lever or with uh, with uh, uh, electrical uh, or solenoid uh, actuator, that's the name for it. Uh, so that was uh, one example that we have here. So you can have a look at it uh, after class if you want to. And also, just to show this one was uh, placed on the bench. So this is a hydraulic filter, so you can actually see how it looks. I would uh, recommend that you, after the lecture, just look at it while it's in the bucket because it's filled with oil, so <laughs> it's a bit messy in there. I'm just going to um, try to dry off my hands a bit. So that's just something that you can uh, look at at least. I accidentally saw it lying lying around there in the, in, in the lab yesterday, so I thought I'd uh, bring it out today. <coughs> so we were looking at pressure relief valves. And the pressure relief valves, uh, so, so the ones that are relieving too high of a pressure, can be both poppet or slide valves. And when they are in their neutral position, they are usually closed. So it w wouldn't make much sense to have it, have it open when it's in its neutral position. Uh, because then it wouldn't be relieving, uh, relieving too much pressure, it would be relieving all pressure instead. So, so they have to be closed when they are in their uh, neutral position. So for a puppet valve, it will be pressing a piston uh, with a sealing element, basically, which is basically the control edge then. So it's pressing the piston against the control edge and making sure that it's keeping sealed. <coughs> And this is uh, a, typical, uh, a typical symbol for one, where we have pressure coming, uh, whether it's coming from the pump directly or if it's coming from some other part of the system where you're going to relieve uh, pressure peaks. Then you have the pilot line that's going over here. So pilot lines are usually shown as these uh, dotted lines uh, instead of uh, a solid line. 
uh, and you have the arrow that's all the way over to the side. So only when you get enough pressure from the pilot line is the arrow going to be pushed over so that it connects uh, the pressure port and the tank port. And then you have uh, this spring here, which is uh, drawn in here, and it is adjustable, which is this knob on the end, where you can adjust how much you have compressed the, the spring uh, beforehand. So if, if you, if you uh, screw the knob all the way in, you have pre-compressed the spring quite a lot, so it's going to take more force to open up, which means that you need a higher pressure in order for it to, to activate itself. And if you screw the knob all the way out, you, you have uh, quite a lot of room for, for the spring to, to be compressed into. So uh, I'm not sure if you, you remember this from your physics and stuff, but as you compress a spring, you, get, you have a constant, which means that you are increasing your force uh, as you are moving along. Uh, so, so the more you are compressing it, the harder it's going to become. So if we allow, uh, allow a lot of room behind the piston for the spring to, to expand into, it's going to be easier to compress it to begin with so that opening the valve will happen quicker at a lower pressure. And if we turn the knob inwards and pre-compress the spring a bit, then it's going to be harder to open so, so that you need a higher pressure for it to open. So that's how they work with being uh, adjustable. Then we have also got a port over on the side here, which is marked L, which is leakage. It just means that you are going to get some leakage along the piston here and in into the, uh, the uh, spring chamber, and that needs to be connected to your tank because you don't want uh, oil being trapped in here. If you get uh, hydraulic fluid trapped in here, then uh, uh, in the end it's going to build up a pressure that's going to counteract the pressure of the piston. So the pist piston won't open up at all because it will both have pressure in here and a spring working against it so it's going to the overall force on this side will become more than anything that you will get on that side so that's why we need to have have this leakage port you need to to get away all this leakage oil <coughs> so that's the the um, typical symbol for it where, where you get the uh, the pilot line up on the side like that and, and then for a slide valve when it's in its neutral position we can see here we have pressure coming in here into the pressure chamber and then we have uh, this piston that is closing off the tank side. We also have uh, a spring with an adjustable knob and a leakage room, for a uh, leakage chamber for, for the leakage oil so that we can release it, yeah? Yeah, ba basically, the, uh, it, it, it's a bit difficult in the diagram to, to, uh, to show exactly where it is, but it is coming from the spring, basically. So it's the, it's the dotted line coming from the spring and into, into the tank symbol. So it's, uh, it, it just shows, basically, that you are connecting the L port here directly to your tank b b because you need... It, it will most likely just be a trickle of hydraulic fluid there, so just a few drops there and a few drops there. B but over time, if you didn't have it connected, if you had closed off this port, it would, a few drops every now and then, would uh, in the end fill up the entire chamber. And since it's an incompressible fluid, you wouldn't be able to move the, uh, move the piston at all. No, not, not really, not, not for the pressure relief. So, so, uh, so so the, the uh, leakage oil is just leakage oil. So, so you're going to have leakage oil coming past the piston anyway. Uh, and so, uh, so that's why you also have it here. So, so because uh, we have these, um, these uh, what's it called? Um, rings, basically, <laughs> going around the piston, wi which allow fluid to, to sort of be trapped along the sides of, of the piston so that it's going to keep the, uh, the uh, walls here lubricated as the piston is moving. So, so that uh, we, we talked about this a bit, where, where we are sort of, we are, uh, b by allowing a little bit of fluid between the piston and the, and the chamber walls, we are uh, basically eliminating the mechanical friction of steel against steel, and we are replacing it with just the viscous friction of having a f uh, film of hydraulic fluid there that needs to be, uh, be uh, moved. And that, that viscous friction is a lot lower than steel-on-steel steel friction. So, uh, so it's, 
it's, a, uh, it's just a way of uh, lowering the amount of force that you need to, to open up uh, the piston. But by using it, you are going to end up having always some uh, fluid ending up inside the spring chamber because it's going to follow the piston off and then it's just going to stay there when the piston moves back. So, so uh, th that's why we have the, the, these leakage parts in there. And for the slide valve, uh, when we get uh, a pressure on this side, uh, where it's the X port, then it's going to push the slide over and then we're going to get an opening between, between uh, the pressure port and the tank port. <coughs> and as you can see, there is a bit of a different symbol for this one, because it is still using uh, a pilot pressure, which is coming into the export here, uh, but it needs the pilot pressure to come from somewhere. So it's actually going to need a tube or a, a pipe or something that it's going to be uh, connected to somewhere else inside the circuit here. So, so that it doesn't get the, it, it might just be that you have a, a, uh, a T connection directly on the P port and then you have a tube just going straight in there. It might be that simple. It might also be that you have it connected to something further up in the system, basically. Uh, so, so this one is, it's still a pilot line, but it is external. It's something that you actually have to install there. So it's not a part of the valve. While in the puppet valve, it is placed like this because it is internalized. So it's built into the valve. And, and the way that's done, what we're going to, to see an animation later on uh, that shows exactly how it works, and, and that's a really, really good animation. So uh, I think I'm just going to leave it at that because you can't really see the pilot line in here because it's built into the piston, basically. So, so that uh, we need to see a, a, a cutout view of, of uh, a piston in order to see it. But it is integrated into the valve there, and for the slide valve, it is external, so you have to connect it uh, by itself. So we get supply pressure, which acts on the surface of the uh, valve element, the piston, and generates a force. So we get the, the area of, of the port, basically, which is where it hits. So not the area of the entire piston, but just the area of the port and the pressure that we have on that side. So that's what's acting on the piston. And the spring force is basically uh, the only thing that's pushing, uh, pushing the uh, uh, piston against the valve seat so that we get that uh, closed off uh, the port there, that we are closing it off completely. And since you can adjust uh, the piston, you can basically set it to, to the, um, uh, to the pressure that you want it to open to, within a certain range, of course, so, so that you, you, you won't find pressure relief valves that are going from one bar to 500 bars. That's impossible because you won't have that kind of uh, adjustment abilities with a mechanical spring like this. So it will be impossible to have that kind of room, but you might find one that goes from one bar to 40, 45 bars, maybe, maybe 50. And then you might have another one that starts off at 25 and goes to 80, 90. Maybe you have one going from 50 to 120 or something. So you, you, have, to you have to choose a pressure relief valve uh, with a pressure range that fits your system. So, so that you have to know what pressure range you're going to have inside your system. So if we get enough force from uh, the pressure and the area here, then we are going to exceed the force of the spring that is keeping the spring uh, um, in tension there. So it's going to start compressing the spring and then we start moving the piston. And as soon as the piston starts moving a little bit, we are going to get uh, some flow going into the tank. So a little bit of the pressure is going to, uh, uh, going to be leaking out into the tank instead. And in many cases, that's going to be enough. So it's in many cases, it's just going to open up a little bit and uh, release some fluid, and then it's going to close again b because it didn't need to do anything more, especially if it's just just uh, a slight fluctu fluctuation in, in the uh, pressure level. But if you suddenly get a really large spike in the pressure level, 
uh, then you can get quite a lot of pressure and then it's going to start moving it further. Uh, and we also have something else acting uh, upon the piston other than the spring force because as soon as it opens up you will get the resistance all the way back to the tank. So anything that's in the way of the fluid back to the tank, so any uh, throttling points uh, in the system if you have to go from uh, from a fairly large uh, cross section uh, out out of the fork here, and maybe you put in uh, too too uh, small of a a pipe or a hose on the other side, so that you have a smaller cross section. That's going to be a throttling point, so so you get some resistance there. Uh, if there is a filter on the return line, that's going to uh, add some pressure uh, because it's going to to slow down the the flow of fluid. And anything else that could be, I if it's if this valve is placed far away from the tank, so, so that it has to traverse through quite a lot of uh, line and lots of bends and uh, anything, so, so all of this counts into creating a bit of resistance, so that you're going to get a bit of counter pressure on the other side here, and that's going to work on the A2 area, which is basically the outside ring here of the, of the uh, piston top. So that's going to that's going to work in favor of the spring, so it's going to close off the valve a bit quicker. So, so these are usually, usually they are not 100% correct, so if you set them to, to open at 150 bars, it might be opening at 145 to 155, you're, you're not quite sure always. So it depends a bit on what kind of, what kind of valve it is. So, so uh, usually it's something that you, you start running tests with, where you uh, hook up a, uh, a pressure gauge before the valve and then you uh, actually do the uh, you, you run the system and then you adjust the knob until you see that it's opening at the correct pressure but it might be opening at slightly different pressures depending on on uh, a lot of factors basically so, so uh, temperatures and everything can, can have something to say here so Yeah, so, so we get that force uh, added to the spring force. And often there is uh, some sort of cushioning uh, part uh, integrated. And that is in order to, to, uh, to make sure that the valve opens quickly, but ne doesn't necessarily open fully, so that it opens uh, to allow, allow some flow through very quickly, but then the rest, uh, rest of the movement is going to be a bit slower. And also, it makes sure that when it's closing off, it it gets this. It doesn't get this abrupt stop that it just slams the piston into place and then it's finished. Uh, so so it, uh, it it's a slow movement of the piston back, and then the pressure is regulated to to the correct correct level. Because you could get the same same problem here that if it moved too quickly and just slammed the piston back once uh, the pressure was at uh, at the correct level. Then, uh, then you would start getting pressure peaks again on the other side because, because suddenly you abruptly cut off the flow there and you would have uh, fluid that was moving through this line that's going to basically just crash into the piston and stop there and then that moves back backwards and you get the, the same problem as you do if, if you're out on the road, everyone is driving and there's uh, approximately three seconds between each car as it's supposed to be according to the laws. And then if the first car uh, suddenly has to brake a bit because there's a cat running over the road or something like that, so he has to brake down a bit, then the next car has to brake a little bit more. And the next car has to brake even a little bit more because there is a reaction times between all of these. So in the end you get uh, 30, 50 cars uh, down the line, they come to a complete stop because of this one cat that ran over the road where one guy just touched his brakes a bit. So you get, the, you get the same problem with the fluid here basically because the fluid is ready to just keep flowing out here. It, it's just going that way. And then if you slam it shut, then all of the fluid is just going to crash into each other here and then you get these jerks. So, so instead having the slow closing of these valves uh, is a lot better so that you get, get just a gradual decrease of flow and then it just all stops. And this is of course to, to prevent damage to the system. Uh, and and this is called a lot of things, so it's called hydraulic shocks, it's called pressure shocks, it's called uh, pressure peaks. Uh, so, so 
and there's a lot of names to this, but, but everything is basically the same. You have hydraulic fluid that is moving and under a certain pressure. And if you just suddenly cut off uh, the ability for this fluid to move, then it's going to, uh, to cause uh, some sort of chain reaction inside the, uh, inside the lines. So you get this, get this shock inside the system. So here we have uh, the good, good animation. With uh, no sound. Let's see if the sound is on the computer. It's on there. Ah. The pressure relief valve is one of the most important types of safety valves. This type of valve sets a limit on the rise of pressure within a hydraulic line. In normal operations, the valve is closed and no fluid passes through. But if the pressure in the line exceeds the limit, the valve opens to relieve the pressure. This protects expensive machinery, such as motors, pumps, and actuators, from becoming damaged from high pressure. Without a relief valve, pressure can continue to grow until another component fails and pressure is released. Pressure relief valves fall into two categories, direct acting or pilot operated. A direct acting relief valve is held closed by the direct force of a mechanical spring. The spring force holding the valve closed is opposed by the system hydraulic pressure. The cracking pressure is the minimum pressure at which the valve will begin to open. This pressure is set by changing the tension in the spring using an adjusting nut or knob. As long as the system operates at a pressure at or under the cracking pressure, the valve remains closed. If the hydraulic pressure increases even a small amount beyond this level, the valve begins to open and fluid begins to trickle through. The pressure at which the valve is fully open is called the full relief valve pressure and is higher than the cracking pressure. When the hydraulic fluid in the system reaches the full relief valve pressure, the valve will be fully open and all fluid is discharged through the outlet port. A pilot operated relief valve makes it possible to handle higher pressures and flow. It's also much smaller than direct acting valves rated for the same pressure. This valve has two stages. The first stage is composed of the main valve with the pop it and spring large enough to handle the maximum flow rating of the valve. The second stage is composed of a much smaller direct acting pilot valve which includes a pilot relief poppet, pilot spring, and an adjustment knob. This smaller relief valve is usually mounted crosswise on the main valve body. As long as pump line pressure is less than the relieving pressure set on the control knob, the pilot poppet will remain closed. Since the pilot poppet is closed, the pressure in the main spring chamber is the same as the line pressure. Since these pressures are equal, there is no pressure drop from one side to the other, and the main poppet also remains closed. When line pressure increases higher than the relieving pressure, the pilot relief valve moves to its open position. This allows fluid to flow from the pressure side through the orifice and across the pilot relief valve to the tank. Once the pilot valve is open, there is now a pressure drop across the main valve poppet with a higher pressure on the pump line side. This causes the main poppet to move, allowing full flow through the relief valve. The same is true in reverse. As the pump line pressure decreases below the relief pressure set by the adjustment knob, the pilot valve will close. This allows the main spool to close and restores a balance of pressure. Relief valves can be used anywhere in a hydraulic circuit where it's necessary to prevent pressure from exceeding a maximum level. 
Advantages of direct acting valves are their low cost and fast response times to pressure spikes. Pilot operated relief valves are advantageous due to their smaller size and ability to work with higher system pressures and higher flows. That was a pretty good, uh, good animation that shows, shows how the flows work and uh, also how this pilot uh, stuff on the poppet valve is actually built into the valve so you, that you don't need this external line as you do on the slide valve. So uses uh, or areas of use for these pressure relief valves is of course as safety valves and then you would mount it directly uh, in connection to the pump in order to protect it from, uh, from exceeding its uh, maximum uh, operating pressure. And this will, yeah, will permanently uh, set to, to the pump maximum pressure then. And it will only open in emergencies. So only when, when the pump is running, uh, running at full speed and uh, for s some reason you get a pressure increase that goes above, uh, above what the pump can handle. They also use that as um, counter pressure valves and they counteract inertia from pulling loads then. So that if you have, um, uh, for an example, a, a cylinder that's uh, hanging from the ceiling that's uh, supposed to be pulling something upwards, then uh, once it has pulled it up, this load is going to be hanging uh, on the cylinder. So it's going to exert gravitational force on the cylinder, so uh, it's going to try to be uh, ex uh, extending the, the piston rod basically, unless it has, has uh, a pressure uh, uh, working against it. And <coughs> the problem then is especially uh, once you are moving it, so when it's moving and then you come to a stop, then inertia is, if you can remember it from your physics, inertia basically means uh, uh, an object's resistance against uh, changing velocity. So that if it has a certain velocity and then you want it to stop, then it's going to exert quite a lot of force in trying to maintain its velocity, basically. And that's going to be transferred into a pressure peak I in your cylinder then, because it's going to pull or push on your piston rod, which is again going to uh, pull and push on your piston, which is again going to to uh, try to compress uh, the hydraulic fluid on one side of the piston. So then you can have these uh, counter pressure valves which will basically just uh, quickly open up and release, uh, release the, the excess uh, pressure so that it uh, remains at, at the pressure that it's supposed to have. Uh, the point is with having uh, counter pressure valves is that uh, you will end up having uh, pressure in your return line because of them. So, so that you will end up getting uh, quite a lot more pressure than usual in your return line when these open. So, so that you have to be, uh, take that into consideration when you're, you're designing your systems with regards to if you have a filter uh, on your return line and, and stuff like that. So, so you have to be, be sure that uh, the pressures that might uh, might arise fr from this counter pressure valve that it's releasing due to due to this load uh, acting upon uh, upon the system uh, that the the return line is basically able to handle it uh, that you won't get too high of a pressure there so that you will break your connection or or uh, ruin your uh, return filter or anything like that so other um other uses is as brake valves, and they uh, prevent uh, pressure peaks uh, also from inertia for forces. Um, and that's especially if you have control valves with, uh, with this uh, positive overlap where you get this abrupt closing of it. Uh, because then again you will get, get the problem of uh, the load uh, the inertia of the, the load and even the inertia of the hydraulic fluid itself is going to work on the system so, so that you get 
gets a problem with it. Uh, and then we have these break valves that uh, help against that. You also have, uh, can use them as sequence valves. And we talked a bit about this in subsea technology uh, when they have uh, used uh, sequence valves to control uh, subsea systems. And basically what the sequence valves is that they open connections to further consumers when you reach this selected pressure. Uh, and that's what they used in, in uh, subsea uh, and, uh, and where they had uh, for an example, uh, at uh, 30 bar intervals. So if they put their pressure to 30 bars, then one sequence valve would open and something would happen. Then if they increase to 60 bars, another sequence valve would also open and something else would happen in your system. And then they in could increase to 90 bars and another sequence valve would open and even more could happen down in the system. So it was a way of, way of making sure that by uh, controlling your pressure, you can actually control uh, control what happens uh, down subsea. Uh, so, so that is one of the uh, the ways of doing it, and there's also a way of doing it in in the land-based systems also. So, so you can use sequence valves, especially if it's advantageous in your system where you know that a part of the system needs a lower pressure than the next part of the system. So then you can actually just make sure that you you uh, use sequence valves and you. You, you open up um, as you go along. Of course, you have to make sure that whatever is activated at the lowest pressure has to be able to handle the pressure of the higher pressure, uh, highest pressure that you're going to open up because the pressure is going to run through everything. So as you increase pressure, everything is going to get more and more pressure. But if, for an example, you have a cylinder that can handle 200 bars, but it only needs 30 bars to extend fully, then you can put your system to 30 bars and you wait until you've extended this cylinder uh, fully. So then it's, it's at its end position. Then you can increase to 60 bars and then you can get something else to happen. And this cylinder that's extended fully, it's just going to stand there. It's, it can handle the 200 bars coming into it beca because it's uh, been designed to handle uh, a pressure of 200 bars, not a problem. Uh, but it's not supposed to be pushing with 200 bars. It's only supposed to be pushing with 30 bars to begin with. Uh, so that's one way of, of designing uh, a system like that. And the sequence valves can be internally or externally actuated. So, so basically using uh, uh, the internal uh, pilot uh, stuff like on, on the puppet valves uh, or using external uh, uh, pilot lines, which means that you could also use uh, use one pilot line that goes to the different sequence uh, uh, sequence valves and then you have one main line that's connected to all of the sequence valves so that you don't really need to to change the pressure of your main line you only change the pressure of your pilot system to, to uh, open sequence valves <coughs> uh, pop it and slide pressure relief valves um, have to be pressure equalized in this case then uh, so that you won't you, you won't have any um, uh, problems with if somewhere else in the system uh, is releasing pressure to the tank, uh, then you will get a slight build of, of pressure in the return line. So uh, so that uh, that uh, will be a problem as we saw. If we go back here, should I put uh, this one in there? But as we saw with this one, if, if we have some resistance at the outlet at the return line that's going to uh, work uh, in, uh, in tandem with the, with the spring force. So it's going to be added to the spring force. So it will make sure that the valve closes more easily instead. Uh, and that can be a problem if we're at this point where we are going to use a sequence valve, but then we have uh, uh. somewhere else in the system that is delivering pressure to the return line so that you end up having having too much resistance on the return line and then you close too early uh, on your port. Uh, so, so you have to make sure that you have uh, equalization there. So um, this is an example uh, of a system. So what we have down here is basically the hydraulic power supply unit. Uh, so that's why it's put inside this box here with the uh, slash dot line. 
Uh, we have the pump in the middle. We have a motor running the pump. We have a pressure gauge telling us what pressure we're at. And then we, we have uh, a safety valve placed in here. And it's mounted directly after the pump so that we, uh, we can uh, regulate the maximum pressure uh, that the pump is delivering. Then we have a directional valve here that's uh, controlling our system. And it's uh, sending flow up to a cylinder and receiving flow from the cylinder when it's uh, moving in either direction. And on this side of the cylinder, we also have a pressure gauge put in. And we have a brake valve put in. So this one is to, to uh, prevent those pressure peaks that we could get from inertia forces as the piston is moving here. Because here, <coughs> the uh, piston is moving horizontally so that we won't get any problems with uh, uh, pressure peaks from uh, gravity loads. So, so nothing is going to pull on this, uh, this cylinder. But uh, you will still have a mass connected to the end of it, and that mass will have its own inertia, so that when you are moving it to the side and then stopping, then you will have inertia forces from that mass. Then we have another system. We have the uh, HPU part here with a safety valve. Uh, where is that one? And straight off from the HPU, we have a pressure gauge and we have a system pressure relief valve. <coughs> and that's one's connected to a return filter even. Uh, so what we have here, we have the safety valve that's connected directly to the pump to make sure that the pump is, uh, uh, doesn't exceed uh, its recommended pressure. But we also have uh, a pressure relief valve uh, for the entire system. That's making sure that the system doesn't exceed the maximum pressure of the system. And that is because after our directional valve, in this case, we go up to a cylinder, which is connected to a sheave by a wire and has a hanging load. So here we have gravitational forces acting upon the system. And that is why we have a system pressure relief here, because as soon as we are uh, uh, getting a gravitational load here, we are pulling on the rod and we are pressurizing this part of the system. And that can work against us, so that if we are running 100 bars directly from the pump and we are running it up, let's see here if we can get this one in, we are running it up into uh, uh, retracting the, the piston, then we have to add also the weight of the load and the gravitational pull of this one, uh, um, creating more uh, pressure. And that's why we have this extra uh, uh, relief valve. So that there is no use for this one when we are extending the piston and lowering the load, but when we are pulling back the piston and pulling the load upwards, then we need this extra relief valve. And we also have another val valve up here, and that is a counter pressure valve. And as you can see, it's only set to 20 bars. Because that one is when you have uh, the system is uh, uh, sort of uh, supposed to stand still. So if you've pulled it all the way back, the piston, and then you want it to stay there, even though you might uh, shut off your pump or anything, you want it to stay there. So that's why we have this counter pressure valve, because it needs at least 20 bars to open up and uh, allow the fluid to return to the tank. So, so that unless we uh, get, uh, unless we have too much uh, mass uh, on the load that we have here, so that we end up delivering more than 20 bars in a pulling uh, load there, then this one is going to stay closed so that we are basically trapping the fluid inside uh, the piston rod chamber of the cylinder. So that until we get a higher load than 20 bars inside the piston rod chamber, then it's just going to stay there. So that means that we can, we can um, pull the load up, set the cylinder in this position, and then we can just leave it there because it's going to stay there so long as our, our load isn't uh, um, too heavy. Then we're going to look at pressure reducing valves. Really that we're going to get to look at the directional valves, but uh, we'll see how far we get. 
uh, the pressure reducing valves is built a bit different. As you can see from the symbol here, what we saw from the pressure relief valve was that it pulls the pilot uh, pressure from the uh, pressure side. So it uh, has the pilot pressure coming in from this side and then going to there. While on the pressure reducing valves, it has the pilot pressure on the opposite side. So it has it on the component side. So it's just making sure that the pressure that is being sent out of the valve uh, stays at a certain, uh, a certain level. So if it gets too much of a pressure coming, uh, yeah, we can put this one in, uh, piston surface is number one here. We have the throttling gap over here between the pressure line and the component line. And then we have the pilot line going over here. So <coughs> we, uh, in the, the purpose of a pressure reducing valve is to, to reduce the input pressure to, to a specified output pressure. So what happens is that uh, we use them when we need various pressures, as I uh, mentioned earlier. And in the neutral position, which is the top one here, uh, we have the spring fully extended as much as it can uh, with regards to how we have adjusted our knob here. But it is fully extended and it has pushed the piston all the way over uh, to that side. <coughs> and we have output pressure going through A here, and it is also applied to the piston surface through the pilot line. And nothing happens unless we get a high enough pressure here. So we need a high enough pressure, output pressure, uh, that is higher, ends up with a higher force on the piston surface than what the spring is delivering on the opposite side. So if we do get that, the piston will start moving. So we are compressing the spring down here. And we end up having, in this section here, we end up sort of throttling uh, the flow a bit, which means that we get to reduce the pressure coming out at A, and most of the time that will be enough. We just need a little bit of throttling, and we are going to, to get the correct output pressure. And then the pressure inside the, the piston chamber here is going to be, be, be small enough for the spring to, to push the piston back. However, if we, if we get, uh, get even more pressure here, so that the throttling part is not enough, so, so we get a, a huge pressure increase coming from, uh, from the pump, so the throttling is not enough, then in the end the pressure here will end up pushing the piston all the way over. Uh, and then it's going to close off uh, the pressure side completely. And we have to make sure here that it doesn't necessarily mean that we get all of the pressure from the pressure side. It could also mean that we have a hanging load or something that is creating pressure on this side so that we are actually getting pressure going this way, coming from A and then closing off everything. Because at what the pressure reducing valve will make sure of then is that you will at least not add any more pressure from your pump if, if you end up in that situation. So it's going to close off uh, the pump completely and just it's going to stay there until you, you get a low enough pressure on this side for the piston to open up again. And then it's going to uh, allow the pump to, to deliver more. Yeah. Um. <coughs> so here we have a large system. I think we'll do this slide and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, continue on Friday. So we have a hydraulic rolling press where we have uh, plates being moved upwards in this case through these rollers and we have a hydraulic motor here which is running uh, the rollers so they are basically pulling the uh, the plate into to the rolling field and uh, the piston here is applying pressure to the uh, the largest roller so that it is actually uh, compressing the plates and, and uh, uh, creating uh, thinner plates of it. Uh, it can either do that or it can move in the opposite direction and actually lift the roller up. So if you're going to change, uh, change plates or, or something like that, you, you can uh, do that. So we have a, a control circuit which acts on the uh, motor. 
which is basically that we have a uh, throttle valve so that we can regulate uh, the speed of the uh, uh, we, we can regulate the uh, volumetric flow rate entering the motor, which means that we regulate the speed of the motor. And then also it has a pressure uh, valve on the, on the uh, um, pressure relief valve uh, on the return line. So we can adjust the uh, throttle valve and the pressure relief valve makes sure that we maintain a steady pressure across the motor so that instead of having, if, if uh, suddenly we were running the system without the plate in there so that it didn't have a load to, to, to pull on the motor, the motor would still run at a constant speed because the uh, pressure uh, relief valve would make sure that the pressure remained constant there. So that it, it would make sure that um, at, um, it had something to work against the motor that it wouldn't just be spinning off uh, uncontrollably. And then we have a control circuit which acts on the cylinder. And here we have a uh, pressure reducing valve. Uh, and when we use the pressure reducing valve to make sure that we are maintaining the correct amount of pressure because we want this one to be pushing at, uh, with a certain amount of force on, on this plate at all times. And we want, this, we want the plate that is uh, coming out at the top here, it's going to be nice and even. So we don't want it to be uh, suddenly thinner in some parts and thicker in other parts, which would happen unless we regulated our pressure to, to a certain, uh, to, to a constant pressure there. And there is also a, a check valve on the side here, which will, when we are putting pressure in here, it's stopping the flow completely. It's only allowing the flow through the uh, pressure reducing valve. But if we are putting pressure up on this side and we are lifting the roller instead, it's going to allow full flow past the pressure reducing valve. Right, we'll uh, continue on Friday.